Hello, everyone. Good to see you. My name is Heather Towsley, and as the Vice President of Marketing for Smart Cover, every day I am tasked with creating interesting content that's informative, it's, uh, it's technically accurate, um, and sometimes entertaining. So on behalf of Smart Cover, it is our honor to have been able to assemble this prestigious panel of H2S experts to take us through the supply chain and guide us through the challenges that we face in our collection systems regarding H2S management. Um, some of the ground rules, um, we will be opening this up at the end of the session. Um, we've got about 45 minutes of content and then we've scheduled about 10 minutes for Q&A and discussion. If you have any questions during the presentations, please put them in the chat and I will be collecting and managing them for the end of the, uh, the session. Um, this is also being recorded and um, everyone who did register will receive copies of the presentation. Uh, so to get us started through the journey of the supply chain, um, we have odor expert and environmental engineer, Dick Pope from Hazen and Sawyer. Dick? My name is Dick Pope and I'm gonna be talking about hydrogen sulfide, what I might refer to as the scourge of the sewer. Um, I am a vice president and odor services leader with Hazen and Sawyer, professional engineer, board certified environmental engineer. I have um, 42 years of overall experience and 38 years where I've spent on a focus on wastewater odor issues, uh, working at more than 2050 facilities around the country and around this country and other countries. And I do a lot of presenting and, and lecturing on this particular topic. And um, the topic today is, you know, hydrogen sulfide for the most part and corrosion within collected systems. And let me start off by saying, why is it, why is H2S so important? Um, it's got three tiers of in, importance to us uh, in the odor industry. And one is, and that we're gonna talk about a lot more about today is corrosiveness. Um, H2S is directly corrosive to metals, mostly ferrous and, and like copper type metals, uh, indirectly corrosive to concrete and, and, and any other metals and also ferrous metals. Um, it also is a nuisance odor. Communities complain about it all the time. Uh, and it's a health and safety issue for our operators and our maintenance staff. And as you look at the figure to the right, we see just exactly what I'm talking about, a triangular area where the bottom left is explosive. The 43,000 percent levels, 43,000 parts per million is the LEL for H2S. We don't see those levels. Um, don't expect to see those levels uh, and won't at wastewater operations. Um, however, from the top of the point where we have nuisance of five to 10 parts per billion, where the average person might begin to, to pick it up, um, that then becomes uh, a community odor complaint issue. Um, and then we also have at the bottom right, toxic levels uh, where OSHA has a ceiling limit of 20 ppm, the immediately dangerous to life and health is 100. And so we can see that there's different areas of concern with regard to H2S. And in between that nuisance and the toxic level, we have that corrosive dilemma. And so where we begin to see corrosion become an issue for us. Um, well, where does this, where does this H2S actually come from? Where do we produce it? Um, in the gravity pipe system, generally those uh, sulfides are formed in that slime layer. And the slime layer is really established in the wetted perimeter location around the sewer pipe. As you can see to the right, the yellow area would be the slime layer. And that usually can be up to about a millimeter or more thick. So it's very, uh, uh, actually a very thin layer um, that's down there, the way the production occurs. Um, when the wastewater in the bulk liquid drops below 0 0.5 milligrams per liter and we have more septic conditions, supports the production in that slime layer. Keep in mind, what we're looking at here is a gravity line. The force main line, which has a full wetted perimeter, you will see that yellow slime layer encompass the whole inside perimeter of the, uh, of the pipe. And so you can expect that in force mains versus gravity pipes, the production of wastewater sulfides is that much greater. So how's it created? What do we need? What, what's the constituents that uh, really in, uh, create the, the sulfides that we're talking about? Well, you start out with sulfate essentially. Uh, it's typically present in any wastewater. Combine that with anaerobic conditions within that slime layer. 
and we have in that slime layer sulfur reducing bacteria that are looking for an oxygen source. Can't find it from the regular, from O2. So they look to get it from something else like sulfate or nitrate or, and so any one of those two constituents, um, they will take the oxygen from it. And what you'll, you'll generate with it's sulfate, wastewater sulfides. And those sulfides will exist in wastewater as we see at the bottom of that page in any one of three ionic forms, H2S, HS, and S minus two. And those forms are totally dependent upon the pH. Uh, in normal operating ranges, uh, with six, eight, or uh, pH of seven, we have 50% as H2S and 50% as H HS. What's important about this is that the HS and S minus two forms are soluble. They will not strip out. The only form that will be released from the wastewater is as H2S. So we can see as our pH goes below seven, we're gonna increase the potential for our stripping and release of H2S. What other conditions would enhance that treatment, that mass transfer from the wastewater after it gets in there, out into the atmosphere where it can become any one of those three issues, or, or, uh, mostly a nuisance and or corrosive uh, and or a worker safety issue. Well, pH, as we mentioned, is one key area. Turbulence is another key driver. The more surface area we open up to the atmosphere within a, within the sewer line, the more surface area we open up for that mass transfer to occur. Other, other enhancements like temperature, the gradients, the high concentrations between one and the other, um, and cleaner wastewater, all are other forms that help to enhance that mass transfer release. Okay, so now it's H2S is in our headspace. Um, the major form of corrosion is caused by sulfuric acid that's created. And how is that created? Well, in the sewer line, in the sewer area, in that headspace, in the, we're looking for, and if we have CO2, which is pretty typical within our collection system, due to the biodegradation that occurs within our sewer line, uh, and we have some oxygen, and if it's moisture on the pipe wall, which sure up there usually is, that combines, and there's autotrophic microorganisms in that, in that layer, in the headspace layer, that will take H2S and convert it into sulfuric acid. And then not only will it convert it to sulfuric acid, but it sits there against the concrete layer, which helps to provide a greater source um, and surface area in which it can help to corrode. So what kind of parameters are we looking at? What kind of concentrations are important to us? Well, as we look at H2S and we look at headspace levels, if we have electrical components in a pump station or something like that, we wanna be careful about our electrical switches in, in areas where concentration of 10 ppb can become corrosive related issues. In concretes, if we get 10 ppm, we wanna to begin to monitor it. It's not a, a really significant level yet, uh, once we get to 20 ppm, I'm told by the corrosion experts that I deal with that that's, re that's really a red flag for us. That's the area that we really want to try and avoid. Um, can't always do that, but uh, we'll talk about mitigation measures to get there. Plastic pipes and air pipes are actually very good. Um, other variables that are involved in that, as we mentioned, are that humid wet surface so that and oxygen in presence. Um, that'll help to, create, to convert that H2S to the sulfuric acid. As you're looking at the top right, concrete corrosion potential, we see that if the wall or pH is three, the manhole wall might corrode about 0.1 inch per year. So that'd be a little bit careful. Uh, mitigation measures. So now that it's there, what do we do to, to prevent it? We have a couple of classes of categories of chemicals. Speakers further on will help to define these a little bit better, but they're preventers, they're oxidizers, they're binders and phase changers. And they'll talk a little bit more about how they're uh, they are proactive or reactive in their response. Plus, just keep in mind that you want to worry about what it might do to your downstream uh, facilities. And then in addition, the turnkey services, um, I provided a couple of examples here from a daily and an annual cost. If we look at having a 5 MGD flow and you have two milligrams per liter of dissolved sulfides, here are some of the costs. If you have to replace pipe or slip line of pipe, uh, one mile length, of about 36 inch diameter, you can see the costs that are there. And so with that, I'm gonna turn it over, sorry, to the next speaker, which is Paris Neofotistos. He's the vice president of sales for Smart Cover, and he's gonna talk about H2S monitoring and best practices. Paris? Th thanks, Dick. Um, hello, everyone, it's a pleasure to be here. I am Paris Neofotistos, the vice president of sales of Smart Cover. 
I'm a chemical engineer and I've spent the last 25 years working in the water and wastewater industry with a lot of that time specifically focused on collection system H2S mitigation. Uh, since its inception in 2005, Smart Cover's focus has been on delivering remote monitoring solutions for collection systems that can be deployed for long periods of time to address issues such as sanitary sewer overflows, INI, cleaning optimization, and more recently, H2S. H2S corrosion is a longer-term infrastructure issue, and the monitoring approach needs to align with the objective of monitoring over longer periods of time and provide the data management and analytics tools to allow engineers and operations staffs to efficiently implement solutions to mitigate H2S. We've all seen the impact H2S can have on collection system infrastructure. Uh, Dick covered very well the mechanisms of that. You can see on the top right, uh, the direct mechanism of um, corrosion of metals. Uh, you can see the on the left, uh, another example of uh, crown corrosion with the thiobacillus uh, producing sulfuric acid in the collection system. And then in severe cases, you can see what happens uh, when you have that type of corrosion. You can have pipe collapses, as you can see in the picture on the bottom right. And so, I mean, the, these uh, pictures really highlight the need to be able to identify through monitoring where H2S is prevalent in a collection system. So countermeasures can be put in place to mitigate the impact and extend asset life. There are a variety of liquid and vapor dynamics that can impact the generation and release of H2S in a collection system. Some of the more common ones are turbulent release locations. So in the top right, you can see uh, uh, you know, the force main discharge, which is a classic uh, you know, location where you typically see stripping. Uh, you also see releases in uh, you know, high, high slope uh, gravity lines, uh, pump station wet wells where uh, wastewater is uh, coming in there. Uh, but then there's also other factors such as vapor dynamics, uh, upstream of siphons, uh, migratory H2S uh, vapors that strip in one location and find their way in another location, et cetera. Um, so, uh, I mean, th these are just some examples of where, um, you know, where you can release. And, and these are kind of the likely suspects. If you're putting together a monitoring program, uh, these would be the typical locations that you would deploy um, H2S monitoring equipment to identify where the problem areas are. Successful real-time monitoring requires four critical components. The first being sensors that are purpose-built for sewer environments and that can handle the high H2S condensing humidity, etc., that you typically find uh, underneath the manhole space. Uh, couple that with uh, local intelligence and low power draw for long-term deployment. The second is reliable data communication so that you can get that data from the manhole uh, to a place where you can consume that data. The third is the ability to manage that large data set and perform analytics. And then the fourth is uh, to provide engineers and operations staff the ability to make data-driven decisions. Here are a few examples of how data management and analytics can help with understanding H2 pa H2S patterns in a particular location. So if you look at the graph on the top right, uh, this shows how uh, rain events and INI can impact H2S in a particular location. You can see to the left uh, uh, where before a rain event where the average H2S was 11 ppm, the red line is the uh, rain event, the, the level of rain in the sewer, you can see that flushing of the system. And then you can see the recovery, which is at a lower level for a period of time in the sewer system. Now, each location has its own unique dynamics, but when you, when you have a rain event and you flush the anaerobic sediment uh, within a collection system, typically it takes time for recovery. But why, why is this important? Well, this type of information can be used to better manage, uh, for example, chemical dosing programs that are used for H2S control. So, you know, feed the amount of chemical that's needed to address the H2S and take advantage of, say, uh, rain events and, and the, the dilution that it does to H2S to be able to optimize chemical feeds. On the bottom right is a, is a graph of a, a typical force main discharge. Uh, these are notorious uh, uh, for uh, high H2S uh, levels in collection systems. You can see that classic sawtooth pattern. Uh, when the cycle, the pumps are cycling on and off, you can see the levels in this graph going up as high as 350 ppm in the system. 
So this information can be, you know, used to understand the exposure of downstream pipe um, to H2S and, and make determinations on the best way to address, which the subsequent spe speakers will discuss in more detail. This is a screenshot of the main page of the smart cover platform showing the visual management of remote monitoring assets and how it can be used to simplify the process of identifying and managing H2S and collection systems. So this is a you know, dashboard where the green dots represent monitoring locations. Uh, you can have uh, identify exceptions such as alarms within the system, uh, having quick visual management of critical locations on the right of the screen so that you can use that for uh, identifying where there may be issues, and, and then also uh, some of the trending and analytics that are packages that are in these reports uh, as part of the platform. Um, I'll now turn it over to John Walton with USP Technologies, uh, the Chief Technology Officer, so he can discuss treatment options for addressing H2S. Thank you. Um, so I want to introduce you a little bit about who we are, who I am. Uh, USP Technologies is uh, was formed in the mid 1990s to help industry apply hydrogen peroxide for environmental treatments. Uh, today, we have a more diversified product portfolio uh, and about 80% of our total business involves treating sulfide, whether it's municipal or industrial wastewater. We currently own and operate about 400 bulk chemical installations across North America, which means coordinating over a thousand chemical deliveries a, uh, a month and we have a decentralized field staff who install and maintain those uh, systems. We're a part of the Danaher water quality platform that includes our sister companies, Hawk uh, Trojan Technologies and ChemTreat, which is a, a industrial process water chemical uh, manufacturer. So about uh, your presenter here, me, I'm John Walton. I'm a founding member of USP and its uh, chief technology officer. I've got over 35 years experience in the industry uh, with a focus on developing and applying oxidation technologies for water and wastewater treatment, particularly for sulfide control. And through this time, I've worked on probably 100 plus projects and generated a dozen or so US patents. So let's uh, get started. Uh, we're going to park on this slide a, a little bit, but chemicals have been used uh, to control sulfide in sewers since the 1940s. Uh, though the techniques used back then were limited to iron salts and chlorine. Today we have probably a half dozen or so mainstay treatments and another dozen or so that I'd call specialty or value added. Essentially all these chemistries uh, control sulfide in one or more of five ways. The first way relies on the fact that sulfide, the precursor to sulfide, is not the preferred energy source for a biofilm. Uh, oxygen, either provided by calcium nitrate, air, oxygen, or hydrogen peroxide, those all provide more energy uh, to the bacteria so that the biofilms that prevent sulfide generation and or uh, remove sulfide that is produced. Uh, second item is that alternatively, we can stymie the biofilm. So do something chemically uh, by dosing, example, slugs of caustic soda or oxidizing agent, uh, typically every week or two, depending on the season. The third way is to raise the pH of the water to where H2S isn't volatile. Uh, this, tip, this means above pH 8, typically. Uh, the products used for this are alkali slurries of magnesium or calcium hydroxide. In addition to keeping these, in, uh, these keeping H2S in solution, the alkalis are particulates that can also settle on, atop the biofilm and generate uh, local microzones of high pH, which can inhibit the SRB activity. The fourth way uh, is using uh, iron salts to bind the sulfide uh, into a precipitate that's non-volatile. Uh, typically ferrous or ferric chloride or sulfate is used. Uh, some of that iron as well embeds into the biofilm and impedes SRB activity. Uh, lastly, the second one is that uh, sulfide is oxidized by many things, including air and sunlight. But for practical purposes, we generally have to need faster reactions. And so we use more reactive chemistries like peroxide uh, or hypochlorite. So one observation of the, these five is that four of these uh, mechanisms all act on the biofilm, not the water column itself. So by creating different uh, environments, uh, be that aerobic, anaerobic, anoxic, 
chemical treatments cause shifts in the microbial community structures that make up the biofilm, uh, as well as change the metabolites that they release into the water. So with this context, uh, I think we can begin to look at some of the treatment, uh, sulfide treatments, uh, why they're more suitable and some are more suitable than others. So if we start up in the left uh, corner and work our way around uh, with the hoop here, in force mains, uh, there's no natural aeration and there are long retention times typically. So we need treatments that can last several hours and these are where those fit. Uh, in interceptors, iron salts and alkalis are used often in combination and tend to be used by the larger municipalities. Uh, nitrates can be used, but uh, they're uh, less efficient at binding set controlling sulfide and more expensive. Uh, pump station applications in many ways <laughs> are more complex in the sense that you got uh, sometimes multiple lines entering into a, a pump station and they contributing both liquid and vapor sulfide. So treating just the liquid at those situations may not be enough to uh, control the migratory H2S. In those cases, some level of vapor treatment would be needed as well. Uh, smaller sewers tend to be located in commercial districts and residential communities and they convey smaller flows and smaller diameter pipe. So it's here where we see the specialty products being used, uh, such as low hazard or blended chemistries, uh, though they, they come at a higher price. So finally, for plant influence, uh, we again need the fast oxidizers to remove the sulfide quickly. Uh, if iron salts are already being used in the plant, perhaps they could re relocate their injection to the influence structure. Um, as I reflect on my time in the industry, I, I, I say that this toolkit is fairly well developed for our current needs, and I'll emphasize that and talk to it more later. So what we can say today for sure um, is that there's really no magic bullet in any of this. Uh, all these products find use in the industry. Uh, this slide kind of helps explain why. Uh, the message that we really want to present is that it probably doesn't make a lot of sense to use just one chemistry throughout the whole interceptor network. Uh, and if I uh, go this route, it, is that what we do find there's great value uh, in deploying complementary treatments, even or especially where the flows are large and there's a lot of money to be saved. Uh, so what, uh, what are the things uh, that we should think about in choosing our sulfide chemistry? Well, we have primary and secondary reasons. Among the top of our list are efficacy, uh, safety, and cost, not necessarily in that order. Uh, since all these chemistries can control sulfide, our first check is, will that alone be enough to solve the odor and corrosion problem? Maybe. Uh, if the sulfide's already in the vapor, then we're gonna need to go further upstream to feed chemical or deploy vapor treatment. Second, if any or all of these chemical management, uh, uh, all these managing chemicals poses risk. Um, and while it, these might be justified for large interceptors on the mainstay chemicals, they can't be, uh, these mainstay chemicals can't be used in small environments, uh, collected in communities uh, due to their hazard rating. So industry, what we're doing is coming up with new low hazard uh, options. Uh, we've got nitrate, mag hydroxide, and now buffered iron solutions are, are examples of these. And these all, of course, come at a higher price as well. Um, so as well, we have uh, some secondary considerations to think about. Uh, the uh, one I'd like to home on uh, first would probably be the latter one. Uh, and uh, what we're seeing here is that the emerging driver for sewer treatments is how they impact treatment plant operations. Uh, rarely is this an all good or all bad situation. So you generally get some pros and cons, and so it becomes a game of kind of adding up cost and credits. Uh, but the driver drives on. Uh, aligning collection system and treatment septic practices is only going to grow, uh, given that uh, there's a lot of uh, efficiencies to be had and ways to be, uh, to be shed. So uh, I thank you for the presentation. This concludes my time. I'm going to pass it over to Dave Bagley and uh, Bagley and Associates to speak about linings and coatings. So my name's Dave Badgley. I've been in the industry for over 40 years or around that amount. I worked on a lot of different committees. Uh, we've done a lot of pipeline rehab, worked on manual practice for the WEF and also for, uh, for the AWWA on, uh, uh, on their, their manual practices and done over a million feet of, of pipelining. So what we talked about, a little refresher on that, 
problems that we have, areas where we have problems are in the pipe. Uh, here you can see the crown of a pipe and they cut a window through the pipe just to see how much is left on that, which is critical. Uh, below that is asbestos cement pipe. Other places that we might find concrete in the system are older pipe joints before like 1975. A lot of those were concrete, some were tar, but you never know what, what they used back in that time. Manholes are made of concrete or there'll be bricks with concrete mortar in between and our, our pump stations and our wastewater treatment plant are all made of concrete. Um, this is a good example Below the water line, it does not corrode. Above the water line where you have the vapors in there, that's where you get the corrosion. So some of the, the ways that we can reduce this uh, is increasing the cleaning schedules in the collection systems, inspect the manholes at the same time they're there, uh, wash down the manholes and get off the bacteria that are on the inside of the manholes and spot check your cleaning with a, uh, with a CCTV camera just to make sure the guys are getting it clean enough. Some of the newer things that are out are uh, custom uh, aerobic biological aug augmentation. Uh, it's done through an automated biological generator with remote control monitoring from the, the factory. And wet well dosing is usually where it's put in, reduces H2S, fog, neutralizes the pH, uh, can dissolve the wipes and promotes wastewater pretreatment starting in the collection system. When we have dropped manholes or the end of force mains, we use a vortex aerator. In those situations, the flow comes in at a high rate uh, elevation. It goes, it's swirled around and it spiral wounds or spiral flows down through a pipe, creates a vacuum on the top, takes all those odors from in there and at the bottom, it mixes it all together and aerates the flow. Uh, the, if we've got flows that we, or odors that we can't get rid of, there's always some, no matter what we're dosing with, then the, the newer style uh, scrubbers have valves in them. So when it's sucking air in, we've got to have air to keep our, our, our flows flowing. So it has valves that open up, allow fresh air, air in, and then as we have pressure coming through, then the odors are all scrubbed out through the media and then uh, uh, set back out to the, the environment. So it, it takes a toolbox. Uh, you just heard that there's no magic bullet. You need a little bit of everything. So it takes a toolbox of different techniques. Options are for pipelining are based off the diameter, anywhere pipes from four inches to 30 feet in diameter in sewers the length of the sewers, gravity or pressure, pipelines, flow control, uh, structural requirements. Trestness lining smooths out the flow, speeds up the velocity, which makes it to where there's less places where you can release the flow, the gases, and then it uh, isolates the flow and gases from any concrete or metal that we line over. Okay, so the, the, uh, the, options that we have are full length lining. These are close fit liners. We have cured, we have fold and form PVC liners. We have polyester felt liners and then the newer style UV cured liners. These all go in, they fit tightly up against the host pipe. They make dimples at the laterals, usually used for the smaller diameter pipes, the cured in place liners can go up to about 60 inches, but you have to have flow control and have to be able to deter or uh, isolate those the flows on that, which is always expensive and it's always uh, uh, scary. Uh, so full length lining for with annular space grouting. We have high density polyethylene that we weld together for the joints. If you are going to line a thousand feet of pipe, I need a thousand feet of, of lay down area upstream from that that I can lay the pipe out before I can pull it in. It's basically putting a smaller pipe inside a larger pipe. Uh, when I'm doing uh, sectional liners, when I do sectional liners, it's usually larger diameter pipes. They're 18 inch and larger. Uh, and it, they're either PVC or they are made out of fiberglass. So I can 
cut the top half of the pipe off. We build a structure around it. The flow can still continue to flow. Drop a piece of pipe in, push it in, and then hold it and put another one in. And I can, can line a mile upstream, turn everything around the opposite way, and then push a mile upstream for that. Usually we don't have laterals in large transmission pipes. So that's a good uh, process for that. If I can take all the flow out of the line, then there's Danby, which is a panel PVC liner. Uh, it's either spiral wound in or used as panels. It's grouted on the outside with 5,000 PSI grout. It's a structural grout. Uh, you can see a couple examples here of where there are shaped pipes. That's LA City uh, or LA County sand photo. And then San Jose is where they still have some egg shaped pipes in the ground. Uh, so when we get to force mains, this is something newer to the, the US. Uh, the, uh, the Kevlar reinforced liners are woven like a fire hose, uh, but it's woven with Kevlar. The uh, uh, six to 24 inch pipelines, we can do long lengths with that up to 8,500 feet. And we have uh, go up to 1,000 PSI and it's able to negotiate 45 and 90 degree bends. There's a polyethylene coating on the inside and on the outside. It's flattened and then folded. Uh, we winch it through from, uh, from manhole to manhole or from opening to, to the end. And then we put fittings on it on the end. And then this fitting, you can see that there's a little bit of a gap in there in the fitting and we will put it as a zerk fitting and we put epoxy in that area. And as we squeeze it in, then the, uh, it will lock into the, uh, uh, the fitting that works very well. So manhole rehabilitation, you know, first we got to grind off the steps and get the metal out of the manhole. They're dangerous. Nobody knows if it's a good step or a bad step. Most new uh, specifications now do not require steps put in. If we have uh, chemicals or deposits on the inside of the, the structure like calcium, then we have to chip those off with a chipping hammer. If there's previous coatings put on, then it's sandblasted off. Then we high pressure water blast and get down to good sound concrete. You have to save all your debris that you have captured and then remove it so you're not uh, setting that down the line and causing new cleaning problems. Uh, if we have active water infiltration coming in, then we have new handguns that you can use and anybody can use uh, compared to like a five gallon bucket that we used to have. And we chemically grout the joints and seal the joints. Then we'll spray on the wall with gunite or we'll just build it up by hand uh, with, with mortar and bring it back to the original uh, strength and diameter before we do anything. And then we want to trowel apply that. You don't want to just spin a coating on. You want to take a trowel and push it into the, the structure to where you have a good bond on the uh, thing. And then you make a brush finish if you're going to do a spray on coating. So some of the things that have been uh, out in the marketplace, uh, you can see on the left hand side, some of the spray on coatings, you know, usually have a life of eight to 10 years, and then you have to take it off and then recoat it again. This is the middle one and bottom one are T-lock, which was uh, a good material, doesn't corrode. The problem was is they need to be sealed. And the prob other problem is, is a lot of the welds weren't very good and we do a lot of rehab on, on uh, those kinds of liners. And now they're not made and we're getting them from Taiwan now. So we don't know how those are gonna turn out. So the, the two structural liners that are out in the marketplace that uh, LA County SAN only specifies and they've checked probably everything that's out there. Uh, the bricks will have uh, the, cows, the concrete is removed uh, from around them or deteriorated. And so we use a product called Supercoat, which is 100% calcium aluminum. And what it does is it keeps that pH up in a neutral zone. And so uh, Richard talked a little bit about that before of, in that, you know, it's just, it'll always have bacteria in it. We just don't want those bacteria that live and, and, uh, and propagate at the, in the small one to three uh, area. 
So this is a 20 year evaluation on the bottom. The other one is a fiberglass reinforced epoxy liner. Uh, this is a triplex liner, has a PVC barrier in the middle of it, has fiberglass on both sides. You put epoxy resin on it. Uh, you put it down into the manhole uh, from the top and then you put a, a canister on the top. You put steam on the inside and it does the base and then all the way up it makes one piece fiberglass structural liner on the inside. Uh, the two pictures there were where they've gone back through and checked them out. Uh, the one was done in 1994 and the other one was done in 2002 which was a wet well. Yeah, uh, the, at the top chimney then we use a the be difference between the, the manhole ring and cover and the uh, uh, and the liner, then the newer things that are out are urethane chimney seal, which we can just paint on, uh, has a or includes the primer with that, and that works well. Sooner or later, they're going to raise the street about every 10 years, they repave, and you can cut it, raise the, the manhole rings in there, and then recoat it again, and any contractor can do that. So problems that we've had with iron manholes, are they rust? Uh, they corrode. Uh, there's one in the middle is we put back the, the it had high uh, H2S in it. You can see the, the white chalk around the outside. When they put it back in, the, the lid fell right through. Uh, broken manholes that can fall in. The composites are the newer way of doing this. Uh, the, you, they come in different colors. They're set up. Uh, the, the new second generation is is really more robust than the first generation of the covers. It's much thicker, uh, about half the weight of concrete. You can also locate those with a, a metal detector, which you couldn't do before. And inside of them, you have the option of putting an RFID uh, chip inside of it that you can read. So, you know, it, people can log in when they've been inside that manhole and they're built into it. They're set up that you can use the new smart covers uh, sensors on that. They just bolt in instead of trying to drill holes in it. And I would like to hand off to uh, Rudy Daniels from Pima County uh, Regional Wastewater Reclamation Department and he's the actual user. Uh, my name is Rudy Daniels. I am a senior program manager with Pima County, uh, specifically with uh, the Regional Wastewater Reclamation Department here in Tucson, Arizona. We are responsible for the treatment of approximately 58 MGD of the community's wastewater into the reclaimed water uh, each and every day. We have two major and five minor sub-regional water reclamation facilities that we are responsible for uh, maintaining and we serve approximately 280,000 customers covering 420 square miles with five jurisdictions and two uh, tribal nations. Uh, conveyed through about approximately 3,500 miles of sanitary sewer lines with approximately 67,000 manholes and 8,400 public cleanouts. So why uh, control odors? In some cases, odors can be has health hazards uh, to not only the general public, but for um, employees of uh, RWRD. Most odors are very uh, large in nuisance. Chemical compounds are found in the present at concentrations or can be well below uh, hazardous levels that sometimes they can be uh, very uh, large and extreme uh, levels as well. Uh, going over uh, 100 parts per million. And within uh, the areas of uh, concern, those compounds can be uh, very corrosive to uh, our infrastructure. So as previously stated before, here's a couple of examples of what high H2S over the course of uh, a period of time can actually do to our infrastructure, uh, causing uh, issues with our um, conveyance lines. And so how do we address uh, sewer orders? Well, within our department, we have a uh, liquid phase and a vapor phase. So within the liquid phase, we are using magnesium hydroxide, also known as Thiogard, that is uh, very long lasting. It's very uh, um, potent in reducing H2S levels within our large line interceptors and uh, very, that are very far from uh, our treatment facilities. Uh, 
We also are using uh, basically uh, chlorine, which is good for short uh, areas of concern, but it, the area of influence is very small and is not as, uh, as uh, effective on our uh, conveyance systems uh, as in compared with um, uh, products such as uh, Thalgard. Closer to our treatment facilities, we have uh, vapor phase, which is um, in regards to uh, removing the H2S from uh, various structures and with biofilters and graduated um, activated carbon units, which both are very good. Some are more effective than others. Some can be uh, lower in cost and higher to maintain as far as uh, maintenance uh, in comparison. Uh, some of them are very uh, effective and some not so much depending on the amount of H2S that could be um, uh, concentrated within that, that area. So how we go about addressing sewer orders is some of the things that we can't control such as temperature. Uh, each site is very much different uh, depending on uh, the conditions uh, assessed within Pima County specifically uh, Tucson, Arizona, we are in a desert climate. We have winters very mild anywhere from, from uh, the upper 20s. Our summers, not so much. We're 115 degree plus weather. So the temperatures that are contained within the conveyance system uh, are, are anywhere in between, very much um, to the point where uh, not understanding or, uh, I'm sorry, not knowing what specifically to a specific amount of uh, area, the temperatures uh, can be as high as 130 plus within uh, the conveyance system. Some of the things that we can control would be uh, the engineering solutions in regards to say turbulence. So if we have um, a diversion structure to where it uh, needs rehabilitation by having that in place and utilizing newer engineering technologies that can certainly make a big difference in our infrastructure and bring down um, the H2S levels just by how engineering plays into the, the equation. And within RWRD, our way forward, uh, we are always looking at new technologies to kind of see exactly what makes sense for us, where we can um, certainly test products and, and be more efficient uh, we are utilizing remote sensor technology specifically related to G, uh, GPS, which is uh, constantly monitoring 24 seven, which allows us to have a good uh, view of exactly what's happening in our remote um, system. Certainly we have uh, various areas within our system that are, could take an hour's drive to get to just because of the terrain. So having that information constantly updating and providing uh, what is in almost a real, uh, near time uh, assessment of what's going on in the system is very beneficial to us. We also are using those sensors in regards to H2S as well as flow. And we have just recently completed a project to where we're pulling in analytical information from uh, the sensor environment and then bringing it into um, business intelligence to where we can analyze that data, compare it against uh, uh, specific amounts of uh, prior timeframes, but also include our asset management information in there. So in regards to say H2S at a specific site, we can look at if we have an upstream uh, chemical dosing unit, find out exactly how much the dosing is between say hour four and hour five, and within an hour have results provided back to us from that downstream H2S sensor that is basically telling us how effective our dosing is. So utilizing technology where technology makes sense has been a great um, uh, help to us in, in not only learning about our system, but also finding out problematic areas that we may, may have not been able to uh, have known about before. And with the goal of, you know, utilizing uh, best business practices to use our um, limited amount of funding in, into uh, more effectively. And so in this slide here, we have um, our downstream uh, H2S sensor from a chemical dosing unit. The trending above spiking upward is the amount of um, H2S that uh, 
this uh, at that particular site, and then the the dosing within a specific uh, amount of time frame um, as as it relates to it. So, uh, the slide on the image on the right is the H2S sensor, but with temperature uh, data that is also gathered at the site, so we can find out exactly how temperature is playing uh, in relation to H2S uh, concentrational data and go back and assess the situation and then figure out exactly do we need to increase dosing, decrease dosing, uh, could be maybe flushing a line uh, to get rid of some um, fats, oils, and grease, um, et cetera. So, and uh, this concludes my portion. I'd like to hand it back on over to Heather for the Q&A. Thank you. I feel like I have accomplished my goal today with both interesting and educational content, bringing together all these wonderful experts. Um, at this time, we are gonna open up to questions and um, I'm going to also provide everybody with the contact information for all of our experts. So you have those um, and you can jot those down. If you have any questions, uh, for any one individual, feel free to direct it to them. They are open to taking your questions. Um, but I am also have um, so have uh, questions from the group that I have seen, and um, and I have some um, some questions that have come up in the chat. So let me get to those. Um, one of the questions is, uh, what methods are you using or suggesting for the monitoring of moisture and relative humidity in the manhole? Um, many of the monitors that are currently in the marketplace for continuous H2S monitoring do include a temperature and a humidity, relative humidity um, monitoring, as well as they do H2S, they will do humidity, um, relative humidity at the same time. So the readout that you get uh, and the data that will be uh, published that you have access to, obviously, if you're, you're using that monitor, will be the relative humidity um, in the system. So it's kind of a, a given with when you use um, the more recent monitors that are out there in the marketplace. We also have another question. Um, is there a list of products that you would recommend to help remove H2S odors from sewer mains ranging from eight inches to 30 inch diameter, primarily in the Los Angeles County area? Yeah, this is okay, okay. But I mean, there's not, you know, there's a, just as it, with chemical addition, uh, you can help to address the H2S levels. Uh, adding chemicals to the wastewater really only addresses H2S concerns for the most part. Um, it doesn't really address some of those other additional other odors that may be there, the reduced sulfur compounds, urine, ammonia, uh, compounds like that. And for addressing those, um, it's generally done in either two ways, a passive way, uh, in other words, provide some kind of um, generally a dry adsorbent uh, at an area where uh, the odors will be released from the system, whether it be a air release valve or pressure release valve, a manhole cover and a lateral access or wherever air might ex exit from the facility, uh, dry adsorbents like carbon, uh, purifil, uh, potassium permanganate, impregnated activated alumina, those types of systems are used where the air breathes through that media and doesn't really matter the size of the system, eight inch, 12 inch, 36 inch or more. Um, it, you can use them uh, to cut. Other ways or to actually extract the air from that headspace and provide an odor control system in there, your, uh, your options range from anything from a more biologically and green technology using a biofilter um, type system or biotrickling filter to activate carbon, to wet scrubbing, to, um, you know, the solution to pollution is dilution. Sometimes just having a tall stack may also provide some relief, um, but there is a plethora of options once you want to extract the odors um, and uh, treat it. It really depends upon the level of treatment you want. This Thank is you. one of the, one of the slides said, you know, there is no silver bullet. Again, going from the range of six to 36 inch, that may take a couple of these different things. And I think the other, uh, you know, John was talking about that, that, you know, there's a different thing. So, and 
scrubbers, then we've got things that will, as simple as ones that sit down underneath the manhole lid, uh, the new composite lids can be sealed now. And so maybe you want to, you just don't want to come it up in the middle of a uh, restaurant, you know, in front of a restaurant. So we have a lot more outdoor dining now. And so you can seal that manhole and maybe treat upstream or downstream from that to where it just doesn't come out at, at those locations. Great, thank you. Um, I also have another question. Um, this one is uh, directed to, uh, it looks like Paris um, uh, with smart cover. What are considerations when selecting an H2S monitoring location? Yeah, um, yeah, good question. So uh, some of it is just related to making sure that the sensor is placed in a location where it's uh, you know typically not going to be submerged by the wastewater. Um, so you know, usual guidance is to you know put it six to eight feet, uh, you know, above the liquid level if possible. Uh, and again, just to, you, you want to place it uh, where it's uh, typically not going to be you know submerged under normal operating conditions. Um, you also want to look for locations, uh, you know, if you, if you have known, you know, H2S odor complaints or releases, those are obvious uh, locations to choose. Um, but, but also if you're having stripping of, uh, of H2S uh, at turbulent locations, uh, sometimes you'll pick, uh, you know, various manholes at the immediate release point, but you may also look for, you know, other points downstream as well to see how far the impact may have, uh, you know, from that release in the system. Um, so, so it, it just really depends on what you're looking at, but there's the technical considerations of physical placement uh, in, in the sewer system, and then there's also the practical of uh, where you're trying to identify issues uh, within the system. Could, could I just add uh, one, uh, two, two quick thoughts to that? Um, as a consultant in helping clients out with this, um, I usually do a lot of my homework, like uh, Paris just mentioned, but I also like to talk with staff. Staff who work in the collection system really are key to understanding. They know where all the well the hot spots are and complaints are. So I like to marry my knowledge and understanding of the system with their experience in the actual practical locations where they see the most problems occurring. This is Dave. Sorry. One of the other things that happens, kind of as a rule of thumb, where we have a force main discharge. Usually I'll have deterioration in the manholes, the next five manholes down. You don't wanna just fix that one manhole. You wanna keep looking on down the system to where it's deteriorated or vented enough uh, and you don't have that the higher concentrations of H2S. Yeah, it's John Walton. I, I would just add one more thing and that's the uh, use of vapor pressure measurements. Uh, it, uh, they sit those in and if they're just bouncing around zero, you know you have a fully breathing sewer in and out. Uh, if you get numbers to where you're building up a few inches of water pressure, that suggests you have something that's not circulating and how representative is that H2S and what does that number really mean in terms of controlling sulfide in the system? This question is geared towards John at USP Technologies. Um, what are the more recent developments in chemical treatments and where do you see innovation in this area as well as um, what is what's happening with the current supply chain? How is that affecting um, the delivery of chemicals for collection systems. Yep, yep. So I, I think I mentioned the uh, alkalis and low hazard iron product in the main presentation. And certainly there's developments on custom engineered alkalis, which is very interesting uh, that's entering the market. Um, let's see, on uh, the new stuff, I, I really need want to go back to that uh, uh, integration with the plant because in the new biological nutrient removal world, uh, we really need the collection system to supplement and help that process or else we're going to end up spending a lot of money on capital and, and land. Um, we, we can use the sewers uh, as bioreactors to take loads and to equalize demands of, of the wastewater plant and integrating that in with these information systems that you're talking about. These are the tools that we need to bring that to reality. So I, I think the money is already there being spent It's a matter of uh, harnessing that and applying it to where we can realize efficiencies. Yeah, this is Dave. Money, money spent on the collection system and treating upstream will help, you know, will be offset or help offset some of the costs that they're doing in aeration and electricity at the uh, wastewater treatment plants. 
So just to other, I've had several questions um, about this presentation. This recording will be shared as will handouts from the panelists um, to anybody who, re who registered online. I mean, if I have your contact information, you will receive a follow-up email. I mean, again, uh, there is, uh, every individual has agreed to take one-on-one -on -one questions after the session as well. Just simply say, um, thank you on behalf of Smart Cover and, and everyone here um, to the experts who have presented their content uh, during our session. It's been extremely uh, informational and educational and even a little entertaining. <laughs>